hundred and forty-one. I put my cauterized breeches on, put my cauterized breeches on to work upon the railway. Thank you for coming in this very wet weather. Uh, usually we try to have the event outdoors on the museum grounds to make an excellent use of the space. And last year, believe it or not, we had 65 people come. So I really appreciate every single one of you that made it out through the floods and not hurricane today, but maybe tornado warnings. Um, and we are going to have um, Alberta and the Laurel School of Music and then George Mancini, but first I have to tell you everything that we're doing in the next couple of months, because I'm sure you all want to know that. Um, later this month, we are going to have a members-only trip to the National Trolley Museum. There's a flyer on the back that's September 17th. And then in November, I believe it's November 6th, we are having the fourth annual Taste of Laurel, which is sponsored by the Street Pharmacy right here. If you've come in previous years, as in last year, where we had over 200 people for the first time, um, we're splitting it up between the museum and here, so it won't be as crazy, we're hoping. Um, and then in December, we're having our open house the first weekend of December, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then our biannual house tour will be the second Saturday. Am I right, Bobby? Yeah. The second Saturday in December. So um, be prepared for that. It's a real crowd pleaser, and it started in 1976, <laughs> which is 35 years from today. Anyways. Um, so, without further ado, um, Karen? One other thing I want to remind people that not only do we have our current exhibit out, but we have a very small and modest exhibit through September on September 11th. So if you want to come and add your comments <laughs> this after the event in the original commemorative book that we had out uh, in 2001, we encourage you to come and do that. Yes, thank you. Does anyone else have anything I missed that we have going on? No? Okay, so I'm going to... Go over to Alex. Thank you. Uh, my name is Al Rhoda. I'm the owner director of the Laurel School of Music. For those who were here last year, we had many children come down and just display their talent. What I love, thank you, Lindsay, for inviting us. And what I love about us doing these events is we always try to get kids who are from the Laurel area. Um, the Laurel Historical Society. When you think Laurel Historical Society, you think about the past history of Laurel. And what I love is just presenting the future history of, of Laurel. And hopefully, one of these days, these kids will be the headliner of this little event themselves. I'd like to introduce Jessica Harzer. She's one of my home run hitters. <laughs> I couldn't bring the whole orchestra, so this <laughs> condensed version. <laughs> Probably not.
the Norton's. Thank you for letting Laurel's Young Musical Town. meeting at the end of September every year in Nashville. And uh, one of the things that we do, okay, can you hear me? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. In your face. Appreciate it. Mode. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, you know. Okay. Anyway, um, one of the things that we do is we give out distinguished achievement awards for people that have been doing good things with their lives. And a few years ago, um, a teacher uh, from West Virginia, a music teacher, won the award. And he had had a bluegrass club in his high school for um, years and years and years. And uh, and his uh, when he was introduced, he was introduced by one of his students, a senior. You know, well, there wasn't a dry eye in that room when that girl finished about what this teacher meant to uh, to her. And um, so after it was over, I I I introduced myself, went up and. He said a thing to me that I'll never forget. He said, you know, he says it's not about bluegrass music. It's not even about music. And, um, pause. And, uh, <laughs> he says it's really about who these kids are going to hang out with for the rest of their lives. You know, the friends that they're going to make through music. And that's what I found. Um, the people I work with are the nicest people in the world. And to see these new these kids come up now through the business, they're extraordinary, just extraordinary. It's just I won't even play with them. They're so, <laughs> they're so good. Um, um, Can you still hear it? Okay. Um, I grew up right on Main Street here, along with my brother, and. Um, this is a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the growing up part. <laughs> That's a very long time ago. And uh, uh, I heard a um, 
would come home every morning from what was then Laurel Junior Senior High School, you know, the senior center, whatever it is now. And a friend of mine and I, we'd, we'd come home and, and uh, we'd listen to country music over a little station in Baltimore, a couple, WBMD, a little light bulb, 5,000 watt station. You know. And uh, we'd listen to people like Hank Williams and Carl Smith and Fred Pierce. And, and one day, we came home, turned on the station, same time. And we heard some music that wasn't, it was just different. It was so different. I mean, we looked at each other like, what in the world is this? And it was a guy named Mac Wiseman, who's now 87 years old, um, playing bluegrass music live in this little station in Walmart. I didn't know it at the time that it would change my life. Um, and next week, after all these years and all the time I've been in the business, I'm going to meet him for the first time. I can't wait. And um, yeah, he's going to be uh, uh, at a celebration down in Kentucky uh, commemorating the 100th anniversary of Bill Monroe's birth. Bill Monroe was a guy who invented bluegrass music in 1946. And, um, and he sang with Bill um, sometime, I guess, in the 50s. And, uh, Right, right, yeah, just before he had this band of his own. Anyway, so I sat, I went downstairs and I got out my parents' Susan Robot catalog and I went, flipped through the pages and uh, I saw a guitar and I gotta have a guitar. And um, so I, uh, I sat away from this guitar one day, it came. And uh, it was an awful guitar. <laughs> I have a friend that calls those hip hop guitars. And uh, they do really bad. And uh, um, anyway, but it was just beautiful for, for me. It was all arched up, F hole. So I got a, my music book out. I learned three chords. And um, so within an hour or so, I could you know, make my way through a, an old Web Pierce song. And so I was so elated with this, you know, my newfound ability here. <clears throat> we lived with my grandmother, one grandmother, and my other grandmother lived right across the street, right dead across the street, you know. So I couldn't find my grandmother that was in the house with us, so I dashed across the street with my new Susan Roebuck guitar. And I said, Minnie, I said, you know, I just got this guitar and I learned how to play. Would you like to hear a song? You know, as grandmothers do for grandchildren. <laughs> yes. So I sang her, I won't sing this whole song, but this is the first verse. <laughs> you didn't know I wasn't free when you fell in love with me. <laughs> and if all you young heart would learn to care. Brought you shame and disgrace. The world has tumbled at your face. And the car love the black street affair. <laughs> my, my, my little Irish grandmother, she, she looked up and I said, well, What do you think? Man? She said, Oh, it's a very nice son. <laughs> it was only years later that. that the obvious, well, I've been doing that ever since. <laughs> One way or another. Um, this song is a song that was written in the, in the 1940s and sung by a, a wonderful woman, probably the first female country singer named Mo Molly O'Day. And if you've never heard Molly O'Day, you don't grow up on the internet. She's wonderful. And, um, she, it's a song I like to sing because of a lot of things. I, I volunteer at a soup kitchen in Baltimore, and uh, I see a side of life at least once a week that, you know, that is not what you see on the streets of Laurel. And, um, and so I brought a bunch of kids down one time to this soup kitchen, and they were bright kids, and uh, they asked the couple who were running this soup kitchen, uh, they've been doing it for 45 years in their house, okay? They're closest to a people to a saint, Oliver. Say. Anyway, one of the kids said, Well, you know, when somebody comes up on the street, you know, asking for money, should you give it to them? 
And I thought this woman, her name is Willa Beckham. I thought she had a beautiful answer to that query. She said, you know, you don't have to give them money. That's the decision you have to make. She said, but always look them in the eye and acknowledge their presence. You know, because we're all God's children. And you don't want to ignore anybody. I thought that was a really well-reasoned answer. And it goes with another little thing I have on my desk, which is sort of sayings I flip over every day. It's a story of an 18th century rabbi in, of all places, Kiev, Russia. And he used to give the poor all the time. He had all these free letters come up and down. And he'd always give them something. And he didn't have a lot to give. And the students were always beating him, you know. Like, I'm just going to drink it up. Sounds familiar. <laughs> um, and uh, he turned to them one day and said, you know, he says, why should I be more stingy with my gifts than God is with his? Never forgot that. But anyway, this is a more modern day version of that. It's a wonderful song, I think. Um, at least the tune and the words are wonderful. <laughs> we'll talk just the rendition a little later. But um, it's called Tramp on the Street. Only a tramp was Lazarus said pray. to eat, but they left him to die like a tramp on the street. He's some mother's darling, some mother's son. Once he was fair and once he was young. Darling to sleep, but they left him to die like a tramp on the street. Jesus, who died on Calvary's tree, shed his life's blood. his feet, but they left him to die like a tramp on the street. He was Mary's own darling, God's chosen son. Once he was fair and once he was young. Lots of different versions. Um, it has uh, it has its American version. It's called the American version is called the Girl in the Blue Velvet Band, uh, and its Irish version is called the Girl in the Black Velvet Band. I don't know <laughs> how why things change. <laughs> and the Irish version takes place in Belfast, but the message is the same. Too many women would sing these songs. There are a lot of songs about girls betraying women, usually. I mean, women betraying men, usually <laughs> sung by men. <laughs> this is the girl in the blue velvet bag. Bristol, on the corner of 
she placed her small hand She planted the evidence on me The girl in the blue velvet band And um, and uh, he was sort of like an ersatz dad for both of us. And uh, he, uh, I remember when I was really small, I must have been like five or something, he used to walk me down to the depot at the end of Main Street. And there was a streamliner used to come through called Royal Blue, you know, and it was a steam engine, but it had bullet nose, you know. I was always, you know, eager to go down there, except when I got there, I was really scared. You know? I remember holding on to his hand for dear life as this thing came through, doing, you know, 75 miles an hour right through the train station there. And uh, that, that sort of event, I've been thinking about it now for a couple of months, it deserves a song. But in lieu of that, <laughs> um, um, you can actually call up the BNO Railroad, and they would actually stop a train here in Laurel if you were going to Chicago or Pittsburgh or wherever it was, you know, and you could get on the train. Well, um, I, I found this out only because of me. I had a girlfriend that lived in Michigan. We were really stupid. <laughs> and uh, there's only a couple people in this room that remember that. <laughs> Story. But anyway, so she was in Laurel, and one day uh, I had to put her on a train back for Detroit. But she then had to sort of get her way up to the Straits of Mackinac and all of a sudden. It was a relationship that was doomed, you know. <laughs> But anyway, this song is called Depot Blues. Rain 
days thinking of things to say. Adam and up, he took my baby's hand. He took my baby's hand She climbed the boat that line Now she's gone again I know that song will close When it's going down Oh, that song will close When it's going down When she's not around. Okay. It's sort of one of those songs you just have to get out. You know? <laughs> um, this is a more modern song. Um, this is about a guy, uh, mainly me, um, who uh, got yanked into the uh, digital age. Um, sort of, this is not exactly me, but I think about myself a lot. And, um, you know, who never had a cell phone. And, and when he got one, he certainly didn't have a smartphone. You know, you know, kicking into the, to what everybody else takes pretty much for granted. Anyway, um, this is a song uh, that I wrote called um, Speed Down Baby. <laughs> First time they called me baby on the Goodwill kitchen phone. I knew my nights were over, eating supper all alone. But I lost your number and I couldn't call you back. And from that day to go down, finally go high tech. I put you on my speed dial, baby. messages by text it's love from here and everywhere what will they think of next and even when that bill come due and put me on the spot I sold my brand new alloy wheel so we could stay in touch I put you on my speed dial baby I punched you in at number one Sweet boy says, how you doing, hun? But that early morning call from you driving home on US 1. Your sweet boy sang lyrics to the music and the fun. One thing these fancy phones can't do is look into your eyes and count the many ways there are telling no sweet lies. But I still get along Babe, I get over this Writing down this song And with the pieces that remain I'll share all my regrets When I post those pictures That I took up on the internet <laughs> I put you on my speed dial, baby I punched another in at number one things I 
often think about in connection with Laurel was, or the mills. When I was growing up here, this mill had been torn down, but the dam's still here, or, you know, yeah. And the Avondale Mill was still around. There was an old mill, actually, on the grounds of the Cotton Mill, on the grounds of Laurel Elementary School, I remember that. It's sort of a big frame, but this is a big cotton mill town. And the people that came here to work in those mills, I mean, you know, you look back historically, and you look at the pictures of the historical society, you know, it's kind of interesting. But life in those mills was anything but pleasant. And it's not so very different from the day when, you know, our latest immigrants are exploited by, you know, people because they're most vulnerable. And back in the middle of the 19th century, it was the Irish, and many of whom came to Laurel to work in the mills and Bill St. Mary's Church. This is a song, a sort of a generic song the Irish experience, you know, um, in this country. And uh, if you'd like to sing along, it's got a great, great chorus. The chorus goes... Uh, well, I thought I'd get into this all before I get <laughs> If all you had to do was look at his body of work, you know, you didn't know anything about it. Like, who is this man? And, you know, now he wrote a few happy songs, you know, but, but um, most of them were were um, a stretch. And uh, I grew up listening to those songs, not really fully fully realizing until I was an adult just how sad they were. And this is one of my favorites because I know. Everybody in this room 
has gone through a version of this. Not quite as bad as he had to go through, but a version of this. It's called You Win Again. Virginia, and so he came up with the wave of families during World War II to work at Martin, you know, and at Bethlehem Steel during the war. And now it was in the it was in the 50s, and he was working at a gas station in Baltimore, and uh, and had a little band. Um, and I just thought this guy was bluegrass started and ended with Bob Baker. I mean, he knew so many interesting songs. And so I went up to see him and, and uh, was asking him about where these songs came from. Um, and they were, he didn't know where they came from. <laughs> His parents just, everybody played these songs, you know. But some of them were really, really old songs. And I've heard them done in, in various ways. This one is called Butcher Boy. And I've heard it done in, um, you know, the bluegrass version. Um, and I uh, actually heard a... Uh, a jug band do it at a bluegrass festival called it Carolina Chocolate Drums. It's an all black bluegrass band. They're wonderful. This one from the lead singer does this song, this traditional um, uh, um, song from the mountains. And all, all these people are from Virginia, so they know these songs. They don't normally associate, you know, 
country music with black music, but it is, and particularly Piedmont blues. It's very, very rural and wonderful stuff. Anyway, um, so at this Atlantic station, they don't even exist anymore. I don't know what happens to them. But anyway, at this Atlantic station, I can just remember vividly that it had one of those lifts, you know, where you drive your car on it and the whole two lifts go up. Not the real fancy ones they have today that, you know, where they put the things underneath your car. But these were, you know, big pole that came up and lifted your car. Well, he was sitting on that lift, you know, and was one of those two things, and with his guitar that he kept in the back of the shop. And he sang this song. And I'll never forget, it's not a happy song, but it's just. It's just so universal, I don't know. I mean, these, these situations just live on, unfortunately. This one's called a Butcher Boy. Sort of started with the semi hymn. 
friend on the street. And with this one, we can finish off with it. Please sing along. This is a really fun song. In my church, which is up in Baltimore County where I live, it's a Catholic church, and they're not really interested in having this kind of music. <laughs> oh, God, their hymn's awful. Anyway, um, um, most of them, anyway. Um, but one Monday night, we have these little committee meetings, and they always start off with a prayer service in the hymn. So the, the, the canter couldn't make it that night, so, this, so I got a call, like, you know, 10 minutes before this thing. George, would you like to sing something? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, um, so uh, I went there. And, and the, I guess, motto of our parish is building the city of God. So I thought this was really an appropriate song. It's called Working on a Building. Boy, that love so well. There's another. 